we are a label, we see ourselves as a label, and it all started as, as a label, so we keep this, this identity in, in our blood, and we keep doing releases after releases, year after year. And uh, we do it independently, we work with partners, but we, we do it in a, in, a, in a really independent way. We started 18 years ago doing CDRs in our laptops, doing CD by CD. Luckily, we don't do this anymore <laughs> like, like that. But we keep the, um, the, the same vibe and the same spirit and we started this because we felt that nobody was uh, making record of this amazing music that was being produced at the time. So we thought that we, we will be, only need to start to create a memory of all this art that was, what was done and that's what keeps driving us towards this, all these years. So today here I'm going to share a little bit with you some tools, some ideas and some thoughts about independent release. We'll talk a little bit about it. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the pros and the cons of, of working like this. And um, I hope that during this session, in the morning and in the afternoon, it won't be like me talking and you listening. We want to be more like a conversation and we can exchange ideas and exchange thoughts about this. And when you feel like you want to say something, please say it so we have this not in a one-way direction. Uh, also, uh, if you want to um, if you want to talk or ask something, always use the microphone, please, so it gets also recorded. And then when it's uh, online, people can understand the conversation. Yeah. Um, this uh, session will be divided in two days. So today we will talk a little bit about context, about tools, about ways of doing stuff, and on Friday we'll do a small exercise. Then we'll put in practice what we'll be um, speaking here and we'll talking here. On Friday, we'll be with my colleague Carolina. It was, was, won't be me that is going to be with you here, but she's in, in, we are all in the same page regarding this. So we hope that we get all the contact that we need to do this small exercise on, on Friday. So before we started, I just wanted also, as I presented myself, to, you, to introduce yourself. Just quickly, first name, last name, and why are you here? So we can start here. My name is Lohane, I'm from Brazil, and I'm living in Portugal for four years. Want to use the mic? Oh, yeah, so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. My name is Lohane, I'm from Brazil, and I've been living in Portugal for four years by now. I am a full-time musician. I just finished a music business course in Arda Academy, and that's it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Henrique Barbosa. I'm a musician, too. I'm a singer and a composer, and I had the opportunity to come here because <laughs> I got tickets from the artist student, all right? So I'm here to soak up everything I can so I can use it in my career. On the music, sugar mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Abhishek, uh, I'm from New Delhi, India, and uh, I'm a music producer. I run a recording studio in Delhi, and I also write music as Goya, and I also perform as Goya. So I'm really, really happy and excited to be here. Thank you. I'm Rafael. I'm from Aver, but I'm currently living in Lisbon. I'm a designer and musician, and I'm here um, to connect with like-minded people. Yeah. Hi, I am Aurora. I'm from Spain. I'm a full-time musician and teacher, and I write music. And I'm here to learn and meet new people. Bom dia. Uh, I'm Mariana Cortesão. Uh, I'm Portuguese from Porto. Uh, I'm not a full-time singer, but I sing. I did already two independent releases, so I came here to, to learn more about it. Hi, I'm Austria. It's my artistic name. And I founded a record label for women, BIPOC, and queer artists in 2021. And I'm here to learn more about releasing music in an independent way. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm not a musician. <laughs> I work for a, re a recording studio. Um, I 
but I work at the communication field. So I'm just here trying to understand things that might help me in my work. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm so, uh, my name is Sebastian, and I'm a musician, composer, and uh, uh, here for the the people and uh, trying to do relations and absorb as much I can about all of these interesting things. <coughs> Hi, I'm Raul, I'm from Porto. I'm uh, currently studying sound in a university and um, I'm hoping to learn any everything that I can so that I can make a career out of music. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> well, I'm Hugo, and uh, well, we're organizing this uh, event, so, well, I would be here anyway, I think, even if we weren't organizing it, because, um, yeah, there's a lot to learn and to share, so, yeah, thanks to everyone for coming also. Yeah, well, that's a bit why we are <laughs> organizing it. Uh, I'm Fatma, I'm uh, helping out with this event also, dedicated a lot of passion and love into this. I'm really happy to be here and it's really nice to see it all coming together. I think we can both really feel this. Um, yeah, I want to learn all about this stuff that we have been putting into thoughts. Hi, I'm Miguel Amairo. I'm from Alvaro. I'm a mixed economy engineer, uh, also a studio manager, and I'm here to learn something about different areas. Thank you. Uh, I am Ana Rita. I'm from Portugal, but I live in Berlin. Um, actually, my field of studies and work is the visual art. I work with contemporary art. But in the last years, I've been part of, uh, being part of a collective which programs workshops and talks which have more like political content in the party scene. And through this, I've been VJing, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. So, lots of musicians, a lot of people work with music, a lot of people like music as well. I think we all do, <laughs> that's why we're here. And we'd like to meet you all and hope this will be a, a, a good day that we spend together in here. So, uh, we'll start to talk a, li a little bit of context of what is this, of releasing, and you're going to see some moments where we'll see this um, landscape change through, through the years. First, what is releasing? Is getting some art, right? In this case, music, putting it in a format that it can be shared. Of course, it's like it's not going to a show. If you go to a show, the music is performed there, and then we go home. When you do a release, we are saving this music in a CD, in a tape, in a vinyl, in MP3 file, wherever, and we are then spreading it with people that can listen to it in different ways, in different shapes, and making the music travel without the musician traveling. So, we're going to speak a little bit about how this um, business, because it's also a business, has been changed through the years and how we came here and how this um, independent way of doing stuff also uh, grow and, and change it through, through the years. So, we can start looking at the 50s because it was the first time when the market started to explode in terms of releases, in terms of music being bought by people and in terms of having artists being recorded and being shared with, with the world. We had records before, we had records since the beginning of, of the century, but here we start with the 50s because it was the first time that we had like a, a boom because record players got cheap, records got cheap because they started to use plastic instead of using ceramics and things really started to go in a way that is similar to what we, we have now. Suddenly we have like all these middle class people being able to buy records, all these poor people being able to, to buy singles, most of it. And suddenly there was a market that wanted to be fed with music and people were starting to listen to music at home in a regular basis. It was not like having a grafanola, you know, what those record players are. are. That was really like a high-end 
upper class thing and suddenly you start to have all these smaller record players that you can have at home. So the record industry started to develop from, from there. But what we got into these um, records, most of them were like singles, like one small record with one song in one side and one song in the other most of the times, was really the beginning of the independent market because there was not so many huge labels back then. Usually there was the record stars that had a record studio in the back and they will see some local artists that they, they like, some people that they found that they got talent and they will invite them to record and they will record to, the, to, the, to their own records and do their own pressing and sell their own records. So we went from here to a really massive big labels and having this, this huge concept but when this all started, we were kind of working in a similar way of what we ended up working now in this independent context, like working with the community and also being a really um, big, big, big uh, and important stone in developing lo the artists locally. A big difference from these times to the, the times that we live now was there was a lot of people recording songs, but most of the songs were not written by them. They were, um, people were singing other people's songs. So all these um, owners of record shops who have their studio in the back, they would buy catalogs of music or invite other people to give them their sheets of music and invite usually as singers to perform and to record these songs. They used to have like a, a, a um, in-house band to record all this music, so it was a really quick and uh, market demanding uh, process. There was no touring as we see now, there was no music market as we see now, there was a lot of things that weren't developed as we see now, but we had this really fast and really really demanding market of recording, releasing, recording, releasing, recording, re releasing, in a way of listening to tunes to play at home and or tunes to play at the radio as well. But this was the beginning of starting to have this way of market that wants music, that wants content, that wants new content from, from a certain period to a certain period and to see that the artist could make a living not only playing on stage but also selling the records and, and putting the, record, the records out. And from here, some of these uh, really, really small record companies started to evolve and became the major companies that we, we, we know now and, and then we, we, we met at, at that period. You want to contribute with something from this decade that you know and you want to share with everybody? Are there any questions that you want to make? <coughs> no. So, from the 50s we go to the 60s. And here we start to have what we now, uh, and more similar to what we now see as a record uh, company. So it was not these small structures were having their in-house band and inv inviting all, all these local artists to record. In the 60s we started to have these big structures like Motown, that was like a really, really big uh, label back then. They had like a massive catalogue that were not just selling the records mostly in their stores. They were more recording a huge amount of records and distributing them to a lot of stores in the old country, having these not only local artists but national and international artists and having these artists also traveling the world with the music that they, they were recording. So with this um, growth, so with this um, going to the next level of these structures that started small and became big, we also started to have another concerns in, the, in, this, in this industry. First we started to change from singles to records. So back in the 50s people were mostly recording songs, like isolated songs, and usually it was like I was saying, one disc, one song in one side, and sometimes it was like a song with voice in one side and the instrumental in the other side. But during the 60s the, the market saw that there was a demand for more than this. People want, wanted not only to listen to songs separately, they wanted to listen to more music altogether. They wanted to have also a narrative 
on the way that the music was listened. So we started to have records that were not these isolated tunes that got nothing to do with each other, but uh, a month of seven tunes, eight tunes, nine tunes. Um, it depends that will be listened in one way and also the artists started to see that they could just put the songs together and make it like it was a bunch of singles together, but they could also create a concept for the record, they could also create a narrative for the record. So this really evolved in a way that is more similar to the way that, that we see now. Also, with the, with the um, growth of these structures, music started to be perceived and used by the labels in another way that was not so, so that was not seen before like putting songs on films putting songs on advertising getting other kinds of revenue from the music because in the beginning it was a lot recording putting the record out selling the record directly to the public playing a little bit around here it was more making massive quantities of records, spreading the records so the, to the whole world, making these uh, big careers, we started to have stars, like really big music stars, not only like uh, uh, regional ones. And in, in the 50s we saw the, the beginning of Elvis' career and then he went to the 60s, but Elvis was, these, these records were coming to Europe, but he was an American touring artist, he never played outside of. United States. In the 60s, you started to have these artists that were going abroad. They were going to Europe, they were going to Japan, they were going to, to other places, and the records were also going to these markets. So the market of distribution also really develops. And we started to see also in the 60s, and we had that in Portugal more in, in the 70s, but in the 60s as well, labels that just did reprises of these major labels. Like you have these records from Motown that were released in America and certainly a label from Spain or a label from um, Portugal was buying the rights of these records to make a record in their own countries. So this was another business that was, was starting to, to evolve here. So the 60s were really important in the way that it grew an amount of possibilities to the record industry, but also everything became more like in a pyramid shape. You have like the boss on the top and the musicians on the bottom. In the, in the 50s was more horizontal because the business was smaller. As the business grew, it became more co corporate. It became more, more scale business and also it became more strange for the musicians to understand how the business was made. Because what started to happen as well is the ways that the, the, um, the labels dealt with the artists started to become more shady. Shady in a way that you had a massive amount of volume of sales because records were selling a lot. Uh, every, peop every person was buying records. It's like we listen to music on Spotify now, people were buying records, everybody had a massive record collection. Records were cheap, records were easy to get, so this was a really, really big and boom marketing. But you also had all the money that the people started to do in this period with the, with the music, like the synchronization, the publishing, putting music on films, putting music on TV, on advertising. And most of the labels at this period, they worked with the artists with flat fees. What we did is like they paid the artists a certain amount, that looked a lot in the beginning, usually when they were like upcoming artists. But in the end, it was just like a tiny, tiny bit of the amount of money that the artist was doing. So this started also to trigger in the artists some of, hmm, these guys are making way more money than me. And I was happy in the beginning with having this deal. They were giving like $10,000 or $20,000. It was a lot of money back then. But then they will see like, there's a lot of more money being made and I'm just getting a really small cut of this, of this money. And something that the label started to do as well in this part of the business was having a cut also in the live industry. So if an artist was going to play, as the um, musics that were played were owned by the label, were not owned by the, by, by the artist, 
they were getting a cut of the money that the artists were doing back then. And when I say that the mu music is owned by the label, not by the artist, is because of what? Because in the 50s it happened, but in the 60s it started to happen even more. When a label was giving this advance to the artists, what they were doing, they were buying the master. So the recorded music was property of the label, was not property of the, of the, the artist. So what the artist was getting was like a sellout fee, not a sellout in a bad way, but a sellout of the rights of, of the song. So that music is performed by the artist, but is owned by the record label. And this also put the labels in a position that were making a lot, a lot of money with this, because the artist was, was playing music that were owned by, by the labels, not by the artist itself. The artists had no saying in the amount of records that were made. There were no saying if that song was going to play on that movie or other movie, if they didn't felt like their song belonged to be the soundtrack for that kind of advertising. They have no saying on that because the songs were owned by the, by the, by the label, not by the artist. And this also started to trigger a lot of discomfort in the artists to see that the business was not so clear as they thought that will be when they started to work with them. But in this period, it was not easy to think as we think now on being an independent artist because the ways of recording music was nothing to do with what we have now. We have a lot of musicians in here and you know that you love to record in a really, really amazing studio, but if you want to record at home, you can. And there's a lot of good music that we listen and we like that is recorded at home with minimal technical abilities. Back then, this wasn't possible. This was really, really hard to do, to have an artist to record their own songs in their own means. Studios are really expensive, and most of the studios were linked to record labels. You know, like the famous Abbey Road studio, where the Beatles recorded all the music, was an AMI studio. It was part of the label, so was not a way that an artist, even if they have the money, they could go to a studio and just record the songs. The recording process was really um, in the hands of the, of the record label. So th there was, this was a really nice deal for the labels because they were protected. They have like this, all these ways of recording music and putting stuff on record controlled by them. So they were kind of deciding who was recording, who wasn't recording, who was releasing, who wasn't releasing, how the old market was, was controlled. And during this period, we started to annihilate all this independent way of doing stuff, and the artists became more and more and more uh, dependent on the power of the labels and on the way that lab labels were doing things and on the way that labels were, were promoting their, their music. I don't know if you want to say something about this or to add. So uh, w when you say that the labels own the music, was that like 100%? Most of, yeah, yeah, most of it. And so also the labels were responsible for financing the entire production? Yes. Okay. Yes, what happened usually is like, let's say an artist like the Beatles, the, they were getting advances of I don't know, like for the first records, not so much money, but for the last ones, a little bit more. But they, all the recording, all the masters were owned by the label, were not owned by, by them. They get an advance, but then they didn't got any, any, any more money than the one that was giving them in advance. The Beatles are a really nice um, study case because in the end of their career, they formed their own label was called Apple, Apple, Apple Label and Apple Studios. Because of that, because they saw that we are the biggest band in the world, but we are only getting this. <laughs> that was a lot, but it was not a lot compared to all the money that the structures were doing. So the, the last records that they released were, were in their own label and they were controlling the old Marsa. So in the end, they were like, they were the biggest artists in the world at the time, but they were releasing it independently towards the end of their career. I think it was from uh, was Abbey Road, Larry B, and other record that were released on, on Apple Records, and they owned the masters. 
Sorry? The White, White Album as well. So they own the masters, they own everything. And they also started to deal with the artists that they were releasing in a different way. They were giving advances, but they started to give royalties to the artists. So it's like a small cut that you have for every sale, for every uh, play that you have. So to start to have this business in a more clear way and to be fair for, for most, of, most of the people. Any other questions or comments? No? And then we went to the 70s. And in the 70s, that was 70s and, and, and the 80s were the periods where the record labels had the most power because we had like this massive artists. In, in the 60s, we had really, really big artists and we have this market of touring developing, but the structure to play live to an immense amount of people was not developed yet. So we, we, could, we know the, the story of the Beatles, again, that they stopped to play because they couldn't hear them, themselves and they thought that they were becoming really bad musicians because they were playing live and they didn't listen to them play, they just listened to people scream and they got fed up with that and they stopped and they started to only, they became just a studio band just doing records and putting the records on tour. And in the 70s we had this big advance with the live music market and with the live music uh, sound systems and PAs and suddenly you could have bands playing in stadiums that they can hear themselves properly. And record labels also were getting a huge cut on this because again, people were mostly pay playing their songs. People were playing songs, even on stadiums, playing for 50,000 people. They were getting a massive cut because the copyright of all the tunes that were playing there were owned by the record label, not owned by, by the country. By the, by, by, by the bands. So we had even a bigger increase in the size and the power of, of the labels and we had all these massive artists like Led Zeppelin here and Rolling Stones and all these British uh, artists that they thought that they were making a lot of money and they were, but the labels behind them were making like 20 times more money that they were doing because they had a cut in all of this. And touring was developing a lot and more people were buying tickets, more people were buying records. And if you see like a band like uh, Led Zeppelin or, or, or Black Sabbath, all these British bands from this period, sometimes they would release two records in one year. We look now and bands usually release a record every three years, every two years. Every two years is really not common so much. It's three years, four years. Here we had like a market that was really demanding for recorded music to have content, to have the band playing and releasing and touring all the time. So you have most of the bands in this period, if you look at their careers, like sometimes six years active, 12 records. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of music being produced and a lot of music being released. And this kind of resonates in a way to what we face now. We, we live in an era of content, but digital one. Everybody needs to produce a lot of content, put a lot of content outside. Here was the same, but it was in a physical format. It was a content that needed to be released and needed to be developed in order to have um, a growth of an artist and a growth of a profile of an artist. And during the 70s, what also continued was this disbelief of the artists towards the major labels. We started to have like these really, really, really big label, labels like Atlantic Records, EMI Records. Sony started to have a cut in this, in this business as well. And musicians started to look at other ways of doing stuff and the Beatles were really important on that because they were the first massive artists. You need to remember like the Beatles were kind of Justin Bieber at the time. They were like a, the biggest artists in the world and they became independent. And all these artists started to, to see why they did this, it's because of a reason, and let's understand more about this, this business. Because most of the artists back then, back then, they had no clue about how the business was done. What was sold, what was not sold, 
who own the songs, what's copyright, what's not copyright, what's that, what, what, what can be earned from the process of recording and releasing music, and what cannot be earned from that. So, all of this needed to become more clear to the musicians in order for them to get better deals and to have better, better, um, better ways of getting the most out of, of their art. Also, in this period, in the, in the 70s, there was another middleman that was really, really important and made sometimes information not getting to the artist as it should, was the manager. The managers were huge back then, and the managers were dealing with everything and getting massive cuts on the income of all the artists on the live, on the records, on the merchandise, on everything that was done. So as we had these really, really strong middlemen in, in, in dealing from the artist side to label side, sometimes the artists were really, really clueless about everything. They had no idea of why are we getting this money, why are we not getting this money, why we sold out the first record and why are we are not doing a second prize, because they had no power whatsoever in making stuff happen in one way or happen in another, another way. So there was um, a feeling that things needed to be done differently, that things could also be done differently. But the biggest difficulty here for having, um, if you are the Beatles, is one thing, because you're huge. You can demand, you can go to a label and say, I want, don't want to release more with you, and they will panic and have heart attacks, and they will try to keep you in the label for forever. So what the Beatles did, they had their label, but they were distributing the records towards major labels. So they were using the mechanisms of putting the records on shops through a major label. They had like this kind of arrangement with them. But if you were small, and you didn't have this power, you couldn't make this. You couldn't get to a major label and say, hey, this is my record, you just put them on the stores. It was impossible to do. So this was a huge wall into developing the independent market at this time because you were really uh, dependent on the retail system. We couldn't buy records online. There was no online <laughs> even back then. You could, there was really difficult to buy records in other ways than going to the shop and buying the records there. So having the records on shops was a major thing. It was the way that we could also distribute the, the work that we were doing. And there was no independent way of doing this. All the market was ruled by the major labels. All the major labels were the ones who were putting the records in the, in the, in the shops, in the stores. And in, in this period, n not here in Portugal, our reality was not that. But in America and in, in the, um, most of the Europe, we're not only talking about record shops, we're talking about all kinds of shops. Records are on sale in supermarkets, records are on sale in every place imaginable. And these big artists, they were on sale at gas stations, at all the places that people could go and buy a record. And this way of making the music accessible was really, really important because if you did a record, but you didn't have the means to put it in the shelves of the stores, nobody will know that you exist. Nobody will buy your record, nobody will have access to that. So, during the, the, the 70s, we had this increased anger and disbelief with the major labels. We had this band that was massive, showing it, the Beatles that showing that it was possible to make it, it in a different way. But then, the Beatles were just, one case, most of the people were not the Beatles, so they couldn't make this kind of demands and they couldn't make this kind of step forward for being a smaller artist, medium small, and being able to release their own records and put the records on, on the shelves and on the stores. So we kind of kept the same gatekeeping as we had in the 60s. So labels were ruling everything. They were ruling the studio time, they were ruling who was releasing, who was not releasing, who was putting the records on shelf, how the live market was, was, was working. We had more and more and more massive tours, like stadium tours were booming back then. People were making, the labels started to see as this live music 
market as a way to sell even more records because they would put records on sale there. They started to do these live recordings of the shows that they will release immediately and they saw this market for live recorded shows that was not the thing be before. They started to really, really work on that and they see, oh, this band Led Zeppelin, they released this record. And now we can make a live record of this record and make more money out of it. So this started to become like a really, really, really big thing as well. But at the same time, musicians were more and more and more fed up with all the things we're doing. We need to do it differently because we are really, really in the hands of these people. We are starting to even more not caring about what we are doing because it's like this God complex when you start to earn thousands and thousands of money and just see the, the numbers. And certainly you're dealing with music, but you could be dealing with potatoes or whatever. You start to get carried away with the numbers, not with the art. So also the label started to become more and more distant from the process. The artists started to become more and more fed up with the ANRs, with the um, way that music was being published the way that the music was being treated. Like some of the artists, and there are some nice stories from this period, they didn't even decide what the covers of the records were. They just put the songs. They didn't decide the way that the songs went to the album. It was really, they just recorded the music and that's it and they hoped for the best. And the, the labels had all the power to do everything as they wanted because they owned the, the um, the masters, and they were the ones that, in the end, made everything look as, as it was ready for the consumer to, to buy. Anything that you want to say about here, or ask? Mm -hmm. uh, just one thought, comment coming to that. Uh, I think this is similar to today's um, book releasing. I know a lot of uh, authors don't decide their own covers. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not really into that field, but that's just... Yeah. Do you have any... Or, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because usually what, well, what happened here a lot of times is like the um, labels had their own in-house artists or designer or what you want to call it. And they didn't want to pay another person to do a cover that the band wanted to do. So they just did, is this guy who's here at the office, he will do a cover for you. And you did a cover and that's it, here's a cover. And it was a, a lot of time in terms of economics and other times it was um, a narrative thing. I know like uh, there was a, a really fun story from Black Sabbath when they released the first record. Uh, they were like a heavy rock band. They played scary tunes, but it, they didn't want to be linked with satanic uh, cult. But someone in the label saw, mm, maybe if they are linked with satanic cult, they will sell more. So they put an inverted cross in the record without them wanting to have that. And they were really mad at it. But in the end, it was something that was decided, not for them, from a max marketing perspective. So we see this, and we see that in this market, there is this opportunity, because you have all this audience that wants to relate with this. And this happened a lot. And even with songs, with the way that the songs went with singles, like the musicians usually recorded and they have no clue, no saying what's going to be the single, what's not going to be the single. Even with touring, I had no idea where you're going to go, where did you want to go. Because also the contracts were really, really tighter and most of the contracts were not signed by the artists, were signed by the manager that was representing the artist. So the, the artists were really with their hands tight in terms of what they're doing. That's why during this period we see a lot of disappointment with these big artists that they start to get big, everything is exciting and not certainly they feel like slaves of their record company because they have no saying in whatsoever. So it's really common when you see the biggest artists of this period from David Bowie to Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones having a moment in their career that they are like, I don't want this anymore because I don't choose where I play, I don't choose how, how I release, I don't choose nothing. I'm just in the hands of these people that I don't know, are in these offices, and they are saying everything about my career. So in a way, it's a market 
vision that kind of resonates with the book industry as well, where you have the content, but then it's decided by the label, because in the end it's a label as well. The, the, the book releasing is the same, but instead of releasing music, they release words, but it's the same, the same, same vibe. I don't know if I, yep. Okay, so uh, I was getting like kind of a bad connotation to this artist that cannot pick nothing but the music. As I was thinking about uh, the composers of uh, 16th century, 17th century, uh, they were from the, they worked for the kings and the courts and the dukes and the rich people, no? So they didn't pick nothing at all, they just told them you have to make uh, this song for the arrival of the uh, of someone or for a situation or for a mess and uh, kind of the way I see it, the, it kind of frees the musician to be musician and uh, they don't need to think in anything else but the pursue of in exploring sounds in a kind of a more scientific way, and uh, I think when when uh, all of the image came into play, like uh, it became uh, the, yeah the image of the, of the of the musicians, the way they uh, show themselves to the world, it kind of also became. Uh, maybe too much important in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was thinking also, uh, how does Frank Zappa fit in, <laughs> in this, in this all of this? Yeah, yeah I think it's a nice uh, talking point that you suggest there. But but the thing is uh, is really related with what what you're saying in the end is the image because like the composers usually they didn't show up. They didn't play even. They wrote the music. Sometimes they they, they directed the, the performance, but not all of them. But the the image of the person on stage and on rec on records who is playing the music is not directly linked with the person who wrote it. And in the pop universe, because here we're talking about pop rock, is different. The person is a composer, so and the, it's like if you if you want to see the if you want to go and see Led Zeppelin, they will be the ones performing on stage. They will be the ones that will show their faces. And they are playing their own songs as well. They're playing songs that they are composing because this was a big shift also from the 50s to the 60s and to the 70s. We, we still had artists, like big artists like Frank Sinatra who were playing other people's songs and they had these composers bringing them music for them to to sing and they were not the composers of it, but we had a lot of people who were writing their own songs, like Beatles were writing their own songs, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, all these musicians were the composers of the songs that they were performing and they were the ones performing them. So this also created a different link from the music to the person we see on stage and to the persona of that that shows up in the media because we started to have loads of media like magazines related to music, interviews. We had all this content that was feeding the idea that we create about these artists, that it was really more present than it was, like you're saying, back when the composers were hired from the court or from the, the someone with a lot of money who just paid them to, to, to the music. So this also uh, created another idea of what is a musician, what, what is their role in the society, and things went way beyond, beyond music. We started to have gossip. Like when, the, when, like when the Rolling Stones got arrested because they had LSD with them, it was, like a, it was nothing with the music, it was the public persona of that artist that, that's, that's happening there. So this is, was something that also they couldn't control. Sometimes, because like for the label, it was good that the Rolling Stones were drug addicts and they were clashing with the Beatles, they were the good boys, so they created this tension between them. And this was something that was also controlled and was something that 
sometimes the artists didn't want to relate with. They felt that they were being pushed towards a, this direction and it was not only the music, it was their own lives, the way that they were perceived in the, in the community. All of this was in, in game and being controlled by, by someone who was telling them to do this or, or to do that. And maybe that's the biggest difference and the, the thing that made them became more anger about that because one thing is the art and one thing is the person and here you started to blend it all the art and the person and the way that you were perceived and the way that people recognize you and all these ideas are thrown for, to you to make you look like this person that people want to <coughs> see and want to listen to the music with i think that that, that was on one of the main um things that people got angry about as well, to, to see this, this difference from me as a person and me as a musician and an artist, because when, back on the time of the composers, they were more writing music their way, bye-bye, get paid, not so many exposure, not interviews, not all these mm. th circles around that we have started to have here. Uh. I think also we're witnessing right now a comeback of that, like even stronger. It seems like that if you want to be successful in the music business, everyone needs to know what you had for breakfast and, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, like how, how many times you go to the toilet and, yeah. uh, you know, like uh, there is this uh, constant uh, pushing for content and each time for more private content, mm -hmm. which, which sucks. Yeah. Actually, you know, like it's interesting to have some, sometimes some behind the scenes um, stuff so you understand also a bit what's the process and this I think is healthy because the processes are interesting and there's a lot of I don't know there's a lot of uh, passion and a lot of effort and a lot but um, I don't know it's it's also a crazy time right now because concerning this kind of uh, of uh, yeah of exposure yeah, yeah totally and it's like when in nowadays you have a lot of these showcase festivals, it's like these f festivals for emerging artists to showcase new music. And through the years, it's really, a, a, in one way, uh, interesting and in another way, kind of scary to see how the music became less important and now all this content is more important. When you're filling up an application to apply to this kind of event, that usually are not like non-paid events that you, the artists go and want to, to play to a professional audience. The link for the music, when you're filling up the application, it, it has less space than what's your media um, read, how many followers you have, what's the amount of content that you produce. All this is really taken care of and is as important as the music for the people in the labels who decide if they sign it, what's their presence online and, and everything that that comes from it, and yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's turning into into this kind of scenario again. Sorry again, but also also even right now with distribution, for example, you send a proposal of distribution to a distributor, and I think there's much more. Uh, they, they, there's much many many more fields uh, that relate to how many followers you have on YouTube and on Instagram, and how how's your reach than actually to your music or yeah. what you're doing. So. That this is what they're paying attention to its numbers like okay is it profitable for us to distribute these guys like do they have enough reach already that um, like you have to be already at some level of, uh, of um, to be able to get there no? yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah yeah I know that there's a label in Portugal there it's a major and uh, they were cutting off artists from their catalog and uh, these cuttings were based on the listeners on Spotify. Like if you had 10,000 listeners, you would come out of the, the catalogs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that limits a lot the, the genres, the, the musicians. So the main focus is the popularity and not the music. Yeah, yeah but even, even in this period, this was happening. Like, yeah. so lots of labels, like Atlantic had Led Zeppelin, and then said, we need to find the next Led Zeppelin. Let's sign these 50 bands. And they will sign 50 bands, 
and probably 45 of them will never heard of them. They released the record. <laughs> it's out there, it's, it's puts, but they didn't trigger with the market, so they were thrown away immediately after this, this first release. But, and sometimes this B and D and Z bands <coughs> are the gems that then some record digger finds 30 years from now, and then that record becomes really popular. But because it was released, but at the time it didn't have the, the the, it didn't resonate with the market in a way that they were expecting, and this still continues now with this. Then was with record sales. Now with the, with, is with plays and Spotify followers and everything. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, like, how important was the radio then? No? Because there was no internet. It was huge. Yeah. It was really, really massive. It was the the radio all all always is seen in a different way related with the country that we are we are in like now i work a lot with brazilian musicians and in portugal getting to the radio for independent artists is something that's possible you have radios who play independent music every time in the brazilian and the american uh, reality besides uh, university radio is not something that it's possible it comes into your into your mind and back in this period in the 60s and in the 70s if you have a hit on the radio it was success you could sell a lot of records and you had like because in in the 70s you had this really big thing of hard rock and sometimes it was like seven minute music eight eight minute music and you started to have this uh, programs of radio that were only playing this kind of music and Radio was really, really, really about music. Where one presenter playing music all day and just putting the music playing to, during all the time. So it was really, really the, the way of reaching a wide audience in, the, in, in all the countries was towards music and towards music being played. And record labels had a major impact on that as well. They have lots of people lobbying, lots of people making promo, lots of people trying to put their artists as much possible on the radio and, be, and having the, the reach that comes with it. Also, television was, was started to be important as well, like the live programs, the talk shows, everything started to have a big impact on the way that the musicians were perceived and were bigger or, or smaller. Any other comments here? Mm. Well, this is like a topic that can be discussed uh, we could be talking about this for hours, but I think that music is time, and I feel that back in the time they had time to to put the music together, to make good arrangements, and to record it in a proper way and then release it. And I feel that right now we are always doing the music in the fastest way possible, mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 with sometimes with less quality because it's very hard to fight against time. So, well, it's like a question for everyone, but like, what do you think about that? I think it depends. Like, all these artists in the beginning of their careers, they were recording in the middle of touring and some records were recorded in one day. It was really common that they didn't have the time. It was really, really... Yeah, because they were always touring, always from one place to the other, practicing the songs when they were like sound checking for the live performance. It was really, really like heavy. And you, when you, you read about all these big bands from the 70s and from the 60s, like the beginning of their career, they were like releasing three records in one year or two records and touring and making it everything at the same time. But th when they got really big and when the label started to be afraid of losing them, then they will start to have time and go to these mansions with the recording studio and be there for a year recording and then they, they started to have these, these amounts of time to, to produce and to do. But this time for this period was a thing that was not accessible to, to most of the people because studio time was really expensive. People were really like paying a lot to, to be in the studio. Only really big bands could be a month in the studio or be like when the, when the Beatles recorded Sgt. Pepper, they were like six months recording an album. That was something that just them could do. 
not all the artists could do. Or when Rolling Stones went to a mansion in France and they were there for a year, there's something that only the Rolling Stones could do. Most of the artists had like a really, really short period of, of, of time. And maybe they had more time to practice before and to arrange things, but as soon as they enter in the circuit of touring, then their time was really, really tight. Because if the band was successful on touring, they were touring all the time. And traveling was more demanding, time was, more, was cut short, everything was taking longer, the structure, like today we go to a festival and a band spends like one hour and a half doing the sound check and then another hour playing. Back then was hours and hours and everything was more messed up, so I don't believe they had more time when they entered the circuit, but before before that, probably yes, but when they entered, their life was really on the rush. And then they could get time again when they got really big and they could say, no, I need one year to record in this mansion in the south of France. And they were like, okay, you go there and you record. Could you put a question? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Well, first, a comment that like you were saying that bands like they had to record in the middle of touring and everything. I don't even remember if it's true. It just came to mind that I think uh, "Paranoid" by by Sabbath was written like, like we need one more song, yeah. and they they wrote it on spot and recorded it. Like was like lyrics. Yeah, it was on. It's one of their biggest songs. One, one hour before the sessions. <laughs> hour, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And uh, the question I have is about bootlegs. Was that around? Yeah. Like, um, people were creating, like, bootlegs, like, versions, like... Yeah. In the in, 70s? In the, 70s, in the 70s, we started to have this book, bootleg market. It's, bootlegs is uh, a word for um, non-official live recordings that are put mostly on tape. Back then was on tape. Was the, because the tape is the easiest way of putting music in a format that can be played. And then they were sold at the door of the shows, at, usually it was this parallel market, like you went to see Deep Purple and probably it was someone in the corner with a bunch of tapes from a show from last week from Deep Purple. Mm -hmm. And this market started to appear. But these recordings are really like the worst. There was someone with a mic <laughs> next to the PA trying, trying to get the best sound possible. And they started to do a market from, from this. It was funny because, that you say that, because in the 90s and in the 2000s, the artists also started to see this as an opportunity to, to sell the shows on the spot. And I think it was Pearl Jam, where you, you, will, you could go and see their show and you could, sell, you could buy the recording of that show in the end of the show. Okay. They had like this way of burning CDs really fast after the show. So you could buy the recording of the show that you wanted to see. So this bootleg thing first started by the fans and the, as a parallel market, like the labels didn't have any end on it, but they saw that there was a lot of people who were buying these records, so they started to try to, in, to embrace this, this business. And then you started to see more and more of it coming, but it started really as a fan base, a fan thing, and in tape, was always, always tapes, always tapes of these recordings going, going around. Uh, mm, it, it usually is this unofficial thing, something that was recorded by someone. There is, there is not the, the, the label or the artist itself. It was something that was recorded by someone and he released it in an independent way, independent from the structure of the artist. That makes sense because when I think about bootlegs, I think about like some kind of remixes or like some versions yeah. from other producers. It can be in that the as well. Music scene. Yeah. yeah, it can be that as well. Like an artist who really likes another artist, he gets their songs, he makes yeah. versions of it, and then he releases, and he got nothing to do with the artist it, himself. Is is something that goes goes around. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions here? So we are getting bigger and. In the 80s, we got even bigger <laughs> than we were before. And 
in the 80s, I perceived as the pinnacle of the big labels. It was like even more money was being made. We got TV, we started like, start to have MTV, we started to have uh, a huge presence of artists on television, on film. The shows got even bigger, production of the shows got even bigger. And the labels really started to invest in other kinds of um, content that they weren't investing be before, like music videos. Music videos until the 70s were usually images of the band playing. If you will see like all these music videos from the 60s and 70s, is the band or the musician in a background playing the song. Sometimes he has lights, sometimes he doesn't, but these video clips with a narrative, with actors, with um, a different context, started really in the 80s because then you had the platform to show them. You have the platform to, to distribute them in a, in a, in a wider, wider way. So we continue to, to, to have all these big structures, these big artists, but we had a really important thing that also happened here, is like the genre of music opened, because in the 60s and the 70s it was kind of closed, you have a lot of, I'm talking here about the big artists and where the most of the market was. There was a lot of rock, pop rock, folk, some classic, jazz was there, but it was something that was smaller, and in the 80s you started to have like more Disco, more um, funk, you started to have like, all these other genres of music. Pop became like really big as well. You started, you, you didn't have only the bands, you started to have individuals. Because in the, in the 60s and in the 70s was a lot still about the bands, like a band that was big, was not a person. And in the 80s you have this immerse of persons like Madonna, like all these artists that were coming by themselves with big shows, big structures, and started to have their 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 space in the in the market. And with this, it came this overdeveloping of the live industry and the live market. Labels started to look at, oh, this deal of selling records is amazing, it's going really, really well. We are selling so many records that we don't know because we were selling vinyl, vinyl, we were selling tapes, we were starting to talk about the CD, this new way of putting music together that will have more, more quality, will be cheaper to do, will be quicker to do, so we'll have even, even more, more music on. And you know when technology shows up, Everybody wants to have things in the latest format possible. So labels saw we can release the new artists on CD and you can release the old artists on CD and release the stuff that we did 20 years ago because if people buy a CD player, they will want to have this music on CD as well. So it was like a big perspectives of money that could be made in this late 80s going through, through the 90s. And content. People were really, really interested in content, making huge videos, you were like in the era. Sorry? Four, four. And 84, I think. And it's, it's the time that you have Thriller, then you have all these massive productions of videos being made. Videos would take like eight minutes that have like introduction of three minutes before the song started. And it's opened the perspectives of all new, new things. But in the other end, you started to have um, growth of really, really roots independent music that was being held up for all these years. And in the 80s, people started to see, we don't want to be linked with this anymore. We want to do stuff in a different way. So in the 80s, we have all these big things. But we also started to have this really well-organized punk, mostly, and in America, mostly related with hardcore punk, labels and structures that started to do things by themselves and started to create these parallel channels for music to be recorded, music to be put on a format. It could be tape, it could be a vinyl, it could be whatever, and also to be distributed. So in the 80s is really when we start to go back to the um, 
more independent way of doing stuff. And instead of, instead of looking to, oh, I don't have access to the major channels, I, they don't want me there, they started to see, oh, they don't want me there, I want to create my own channels. I want to create my own way of putting music to be shared, to linking with people, to make people, make stuff work. So in America, mostly we started to have this really, really, really DIY culture that emerged. And people started to see, oh, I can do this without needing this massive structure of people that are not understanding what I do. They don't want to understand what I do. They don't want me in their market. They don't think I have space in their market. So we have labels like Discord, and there's like one of the, the biggest ones in this independent market. <laughs> that what they will do is like have this music, and I know all this music that's happening now, and I know that no one will want to record this, so I'll find a way to record this. So equip equipment got cheaper on that period, not as cheap as we have today, but people could buy some mics, they could buy like a four channel recording mixer, they could buy some <coughs> material, they could get like a garage, record the band, have the master. The master now is owned by this small label or by the artist. Then we need to get this master and put it in a way that people can listen to this music. And we started to have loads of tapes. Tapes were really, really important on this period. People were exchanging tapes, trading tapes. Tapes is a really important format because it was easy to do. It was easy to copy. Like everywhere you had a two deck tape at home that you could copy. You can make from one tape, you can make 50 tapes, 60 tapes. And there was no way of uh, limiting this, this spread of the tapes. And also you started to have a decrease in the interest for vinyl because of this CD thing. So the factories got scared and they started to open up to smaller batches of vinyl. So suddenly you could go to a, to a vinyl factory in, in the United States and ask for a thousand records and they will do it because a few years ago they were like doing a, 20 million records for Led Zeppelin and for Rolling Stones, but now they were doing just like 200,000 for Madonna because they were thinking about, oh, now we're going to move to CD because we want this new format. So they opened the doors to these smaller amounts of vinyl to be produced and to be, and to be made by these smaller um, uh, labels. Also, we started to have more and more uh, opening from the record shops to deal directly with the labels or in the, with the artists because record shops were also being dominated by the big industries and the big labels and in the 80s they started to see that people were there was a lot of people that were aiming for other offer aiming for other stuff that was not being represented on these big catalogs and they started to deal with small labels with um, I'm not talking here about the big commerce chains but like th those Records start from the corner, the ones that were there forever. So suddenly starting to be more open about making small deals again, to working with smaller independent labels, working with smaller artists. So the 80s are really important because they kind of started the way to creating this parallel market, this market that we aim to talk today, not the market of the major labels, of the people who are really unlinked with the music that they're doing, but more this independent market where people are really uh, next to the product that they are doing, people are really caring about what they are doing, and there is a concern about what's the role of the artist, a concern about when an artist has a relationship with a label, understanding what's the deal, what's the money that's being made, understanding why the record will cost $20, how is that money being distributed from the label to the artist, to the store, how the, the record is going to be distributed to the chain of, of, uh, of stores, and also how can we use this record to tour, how can we use this record to go to venues, to go to places, to, to, um, to make a touring out of, out of this living. Also in the 80s it started a really, really big catalog bought by, from records, like people started to buy records directly from the label. 
instead of just going to the stores, all these independent labels, usually they could mail, then like mail out the old um, newsletters was actually <laughs> printed and they will be sent for, for the homes of the people. And sometimes people will buy the records directly from the label in, and they will be mailed at home. And this created also a whole new market that was developed in the years to come. So in the 80s, we have these really two different realities. In the other hand, in, in one way, we had the major labels all throwing champagne and thinking this was, this was the best time of their lives and making the most money out of it. And in the other hand, we had this really independent circuit developing, getting the tools, doing stuff themselves, and seeing that it was possible to do it themselves and was possible to create this circuit outside of these major labels and not needing these, these major labels for anything related with the music that they were doing and in the way that they were distributing their music. Any comments here? Any questions? No? We are almost there. Now the 90s. <laughs> so we go to the 90s, we have CD full on. People are just selling CDs, a lot of CDs. CDs even brought more money to the record industry because CDs are cheaper to do. They can fit more songs. They, they were also selling new equipment because people have had their vinyl players at home and their tape players and suddenly they needed a new way of playing the music so they needed to buy a CD player. So everybody was happy. Everybody was just selling a lot of stuff and were happy with, with the way that things were, were done. And we had this um, change in the, in, the, um, in the industry that came from all these independent labels all these things that we were talking in the 80s that were small, that were developing these, these artists, certainly they go to the 90s and they, they had the most interesting bands in the country. I'm, I'm talking mostly about, about America here. They had like all these bands that were playing for a long time, they were touring the country on and on, they were having an audience, they were really relating with their, with, with their crowds and they were having this a uh, face-to-face -face relationship with their audience that was really opposite to what the major labels were doing. So it happened one time where these independent labels suddenly started to feed the major labels. And the biggest example is a band that's here, is Nirvana. They came from a DIY background. They did first records by themselves. They were part of this punk rock community. They were trading tapes touring in a van, sleeping on the floors, they really come from this universe. And certainly they were signed by Gaffan Records and they were the biggest band in the world. And this happened just like this. And this was not the process before. Before you were a band, you were playing and you were signed immediately by a big label. He, and now you started to have these paths of bands coming from, from a smaller structure and smaller labels and then becoming signed and becoming huge. And also, this helped labels to get more exposure. You have the label released the first records from Nirvana, Sub Pop, I don't know if you heard of them. Now we all know about them, but back then, Sub Pop was like any label that we heard about, that was from a, a city in America that is not even a city that is related with culture. It's Seattle is like Covilhã of Portugal, of America. I'm nothing against Covilhã, but it's a really, really small, small town and not seen as a vibrant cosmopolitan place. And was also really important because certainly we have these really small structures like Soup Pop, like Matador, like all these American labels, then started to have this attention and Soap Pop suddenly they had the catalog of the biggest band in the world records before Nevermind. They started to have a lot of interest from these records. It's needed to organize, it needed to get ways of distributing their music in a way that's more reachable than the ways that they were doing to be before. So what happened is you started also to have organizations that started to deal with distribution in an independent level because you had a market. And this is always linked, one thing to the other. Things develop when you have a market. 
when there is sense of business, when there is sense of making money with, with something. So suddenly in the 90s, there was this market for independent industry. There was a market for independent labels, independent artists. That was, again, not wanting to communicate with the major thing. Major thing was doing their own thing, and the independent was just developing, developing, developing. And in the 90s also happened that things started to get even not, I don't want to say easier because they are not easy, but more real. To record was easier. Put a record on a CD was easier. Distribute a record was easier. You had more magazines, more people buying stuff directly to the label. So all this really contributed as well to make these structures stronger, make these structures reach a wider audience, make these structures get to more, to more and more people. And we also started to see these labels that were perceived as independent started to have a, a way, a, a, um, not a way, but have a position in the market that sometimes they were competing with the major ones. Sometimes they were in a, in a, not being the small guy, but sometimes being like the big guy as well. And not only being something that comes in the, in, in the, in the back, sometimes having the power to also communicate with a lot of people, sell a lot of records, manage the rights of, of, of big artists, but also, but always with this on mind, trying to be more fair with the artists, more fair with the deals, and be more transparent about the ways that they were, they were doing stuff. Any questions here? Well, that was exactly what I wanted to ask. Um, if you know how the, the independent labels, starting from that time, how they approach the whole ownership question. Mm -hmm. Like, must mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Usually there's, there's two ways that uh, independent labels work with the master of the, um, the music, or the, 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 um, the, who owns the master of the record. It could be two ways. One way is the artist keeps the master and the label just distributes the record. So the label in the end works more as a distributor uh, than a label. Because the word label sometimes, on its origins, it means to have the master. So the, the one who has the master is the label, is the one who's releasing it. But in the 90s, we started to see records that had the stamp of the label, but the, ma the owner of the master was actually the musicians, not the label itself. So the label, what we'll, what we'll do is like work with the artist into creating the package of the record, working with the artist with the communication, working with the artist towards distribution, put their stamp on, put them on the catalog, but in the end they will have a cut of the record they'll have like a percentage of the record. Let's say it was a, a shared risk. Instead of the label going and paying, I don't know, 50,000 euros and then the artist gets nothing or gets 1% or 2% because these are the percentages of royalties. Sometimes it's 1%, 0.8%. It's not like a lot of, it's not a big share. There are small shares. Or in this reality was like, we work, the, the artist owns the master and the label gets 40% and the artist gets 60%. And the, or the label gets 30 and the artist gets 70. And there was a shared knowledge about the costing, about how are we, what are we investing in this record. So what's really common and is really common on these ways of doing stuff is like, we, we're going to release this record and the band arrives with a master ready. When I say with a master, I say they arrive with the recorded songs, they are ready to be released and mastered and everything. And they spend 10,000 euros doing that. And then the label goes on their side and say, I'm going to hire a PR to do the communication, is 2,500 euros. I'm going to make 1,000 vinyls, is 4,000 euros. I'm going to make all of this and I'm going to spend 15,000 euros and together is 25,000. And it's really common that sometimes the first money that comes in is to cover the expenses from all the involved, so to cover the 10,000 spent by the band and the 15,000 uh, spent by the label, and they are split 
uh, in a way that is comparable to the investment. So the one who invested more gets the, the, the bigger percentage. And when this is covered, then they started to spill, split profits from one side to the other. And in nowadays, like here, we're talking about a physical market. People were releasing uh, CD, vinyl, tape, sometimes VHS was also released, mini discs sometimes as well, and uh, publishing rights as well. So we could say, you could have like, if this song goes on a movie, if this song goes on, the, um, on, a, on a TV series, if this song goes on whatever, then will be different deals. You know, for the physical market, let's say, is 50-40. For the, um, the publishing market, it could be 80-20. And then you have the um, owner of the master reproduction deals. It's like, in, when you own the master, because you have two rights is, and two different ones. One is the copyright, it's like the person who wrote the music, is like the author who wrote the music, and then you have the right of the master being reproduced. It's like when a song plays on the radio, there's two uh, companies that the radio needs to, play, to pay. One company deals with copyright, deals with the, the person who wrote the music, and the other company deals with paying the person who owns the master. And traditionally, this divides into copyright to the artist, master to the label. And in these more independent, independent deals, it's not always like this, because you could have splits in both, you could have ways of working in both. But what's more important here, more than the deal, is that the artist is aware that this exists. Because this was not always the case. Mostly this was not the case at all. There was no, they had no clue that there was this reproduction, this mechanical reproduction money. They, were, they, they had no idea that the rights could be paid directly to them instead of being paid to the label and then the label will give them just a small cut. And what this um, independent and more horizontal way of working brought to the table is actually cl being clear and the artist being clear about what can we earn, what can we get, how can we manage this, this, this income outside of record sales because the mo people thought about record sales but didn't thought about any, anything else and these deals started to have all these different cuts to different parts of the income that could be made from the records. I don't know if I answered your question, yeah? Yeah. Can I also ask a question? Yeah. Do you know if, uh, let's say, Nirvana was always, had a good relationship with their label, Productivist? No. Because they, they only released one record independently, only the first one, on Soup Pop. Then they got signed by Gaffen Records. It's like a huge record label. And uh, was their last record, the Inutro one, that the record label didn't want it to release. They said, this is too heavy, we don't want this. And they asked another engineer to master and to mix the record again so they could got a version that was more mm -hmm. to their taste. Yeah. yeah. Because when you go to the it's a different approach. When you go to the like the soup, these guys at Soup Pop, they wanted to release music. They released, sometimes it went good, sometimes it went bad, but they were really, their drive was to put on record all this music that was being made in their community. When you go to a Gaffen Records, like this massive thing, they want to make money. And they make money from, and they are, they, sometimes they don't understand the process of the artist, like the band recorded this album, but this album was encapsulating this moment of the band. And they moved on and they wanted to do another stuff, but they wanted this again. They wanted to have this kind of recipe because that's the recipe for success. So they struggle a little bit to, to deal with that. There, there's some stories of even like David Bowie and the Stooges. Sometimes they release the records like when the label start, stops to have ownership or when, when they can buy the rights from the label and they release the record as they wanted to. David Bowie did that like in the 2000s with a record that was released 
not like he wanted to. So he bought the records and then he released the record in the way that it should sound because he was unable, he didn't want it to sound like it was released. So this was a thing that happened a lot. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I remember that at this time I started to buy my own records, so I, this one was one of these. And it was started to be really important, uh, the object of the record as a concept and object of art. Could you please talk a little bit about who made this? Mm -hmm. Which collaborators came out with this concept? Mm -hmm. As this to do with independent releases, mm -hmm. who was taking care of this? Was the artist collaborating with some visual artists? Or was the independent labels doing this job? Mm -hmm. it, it depends from artist to artist and from, from label to label. We have, like in, in the UK, Factory Records releases um, I, all these bands from Manchester from the 80s. I'm forgetting all their names. Uh, I, what's that big one? The Division, uh, New Order. Uh, sorry? Sisters of Mercy. That, like that. That label, they had this designer, uh, Saville, and he was designing most of the covers of, of all the bands. But he was talking with the bands, he, he didn't have this line of doing things that was too standardized. They, were, they had their guy, and the guy was really good, he kind of changed the history of graphic design in a way. Sa David Saville, I think is, is his name. It's something Saville, I don't remember the first name. And, uh, but he, he wasn't this guy that, oh, I'm going to do this cover, like, I don't care. No, he was talking to the artists, see what they were doing. There was like a relationship until they got to the, to, the, to the thing that they were all happy with. And there are some other artists who have a vision for everything. So they say, no, I want this artist that I like to make the record cover for, for this record. But there are some other artists that don't bring these ideas to the table. They're like, oh, I care about the music, about the cover, give me some ideas. And then I can see what I like and what I, what I don't like. So sometimes, or is a label like that one, the factory one, that is really, they have their formula and they want to work all the time with the same person, or is really up to each release. Some releases, the artist brings someone who, who designed the thing, in other releases, the artist wants the input from the label and try to do something together. I think that the biggest difference from independent to major is that there is a conversation. It's not like, hey, this is your record cover set up, it's going to be released tomorrow. It's more like, hey, if you brought someone cool, let's see, and usually it's really hard for an independent label to say no to an artist that only if he's like, in insanely expensive and they don't have the money to pay him. But otherwise, usually the, no one will veto a, a cover from, from an artist. Or in other way, if the artist wants the input from the label, then a conversation starts from them. Maybe the label suggests some artist that they worked in the past or someone that they want to work and we start to have a relationship from, from there. I don't know if I answer. <laughs> yeah, I was going to add that, that I think it's a lot about communication. Uh, when we started releasing uh, our first records, we we had this. We still have work with this illustrator that we liked a lot, and we we started with more like projectual records uh, that were more compilations that were uh, like connected to a certain concept, and then we released the first band, and they said, "Yeah, but we want to design our own cover, or like we want this guy to design our our cover." We're like, yeah, of course you do. <laughs> you know, so we, yeah, we hadn't thought about that, so let's let's change. We already had imagined like the all how pretty they all look with the same kind of you know. But then you you bump into this kind of uh, situations, and it only with good communication between all the parts involved is uh, when you actually like it's trial and error. Also, yeah. you know, like uh, and each artist and each uh, record is a is a different uh, situation. So you, you always have to adapt a lot. And uh, Fatno and me were talking about this book that we were reading about, uh, well, about uh, independent uh, record labels. And there was this sentence, I don't know exactly what it is, but it had to do that with the fact that an independent label is not a major, a smaller major 
it completely has different value structure and a different uh, hierarchy structure and a different, it just works in a very different way. So it's not a small label that works like a major, but uh, smaller is a completely different thing. And I think this is one of the, this transparency and this communication, I think is what, uh, what really makes a label yeah. independent more than anything else, more than the size or what's not. Yeah, horizontal communication and always talking about everything is really important. There is this contemporary label called Sacred Bones and they have these releases where they, on the top left corner, they always put like a watermark. It's like their logos. So all, all the art from the records is different and is done by different designers and different people. But they always have this kind of watermark in the corner because it's a way of they saw to generate continuity and and, and um, identity. But they had a thing with an artist just a few years ago that it was like, no, I don't want that. <laughs> like, because I want this picture only. Like, no, but in this label you have like a hundred releases that we have this, like, cool, but I don't want it. <laughs> and they have this, this is the only release that they have that doesn't have that watermark. And it's one, I act, Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they really wanted to release, it's actually one of their most su successful artists, so they really wanted, they didn't want to lose the release for the <laughs> watermark. So sometimes it's a lot about that, it's also changing. You started with this idea, I want to have all my covers done by the same person, but suddenly it's like, mm, <laughs> maybe. We actually, we saw that with the Obi strip, you know, these little strips that sometimes go around records that started in the Japanese market, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's a way of uh, keeping our, some kind of, rapid line, but without, uh, if you want to take it out away, you can and just yeah. leave the cover like it is, but it's there, no? Like when you look at it, when you look at the records, it's there. So there's also creativity that can come into, into this process, no? Yeah. Of, uh, how to respect both yeah. sides, no? Totally. Any, yeah? So before internet, when you say that a band like Nirvana, for example, they, they began small, like underdog guys, and then they uh, were signed by a major, how would the major or the agents approach a new country? Like, for example, today they could see their Instagrams and see that they have a lot of followers, but back then, what would the metrics be like? We sold out in Michigan and we, sell, we sold like a lot of records. How would they sell a product? in terms of reaching other markets? So there was a lot about excitement for this level. So all these, these smaller bands, when they grabbed the attention of a major label, and major labels at the, this time had this figure of A&R, the artists and relationships. And usually it was young people that was aware of what's going on in the community. So when they were feeling excitement about something. Oh, I heard this band is amazing. They're playing and they last uh, six weeks ago they played and they played for a hundred, but now they're playing for 300 and they felt like this was going to somewhere. They will send someone there to see the band and if they like, if they felt like the band could be something good, they will sign them on, on, on the spot. And then they will use their mechanisms to try to make that band bigger everywhere because all these labels had reaches internationally, they have partners, so they will say like, now this is the band that we will bet on. And everybody was working towards the band to make it bigger. But it was a lot of error. But a lot of bands that didn't went nowhere. Like we know the cases of the ones who did, but for one who did, there was like a hundred who didn't. So there was a lot of, because it's art and art is, Sometimes you can do everything right and it, it doesn't resonate. And sometimes you can do everything wrong and it resonates because there is a part of it that you don't, you don't control. And what independent labels brought to the table to, to, and helped in a way these major labels to, to do their, their job is this excitement thing. It becomes like something that was measurable because you could see all oh, this band they sold all these records in this smaller label. They, they have this big attention. They, maybe they went to Europe once because also this, 
this is all about network and these independent labels also formed a really big network of people who were trading things maybe if you release something in Portugal you could link with a label from Boston and then they will sell your CDs there and you could sell their CDs here so this was something that the, um, that was really strong people were talking by phone or talking by, by letter and they created this network who made all these artists have a circuit to to play and to perform and they could create more enthusiasm them for a bigger one to come and, and grab them and continue the work or not or, or make the band disappear in, in two years that also happened happened a lot yeah yeah because now there's been like a, a big talk uh, uh, that started with covid and and, and he'll, he's continuing here is is about this where, where it's called grassroots venues. It's the venues where the bands start to play. Because we are facing in some cities this, um, mostly for the live industry, but then it resonates with the recorded industry as well, that everything is too institutionalized. So when a band starts, it, it will never start to play in the theater. They'll need to start to play in a bar or in a club and then grow and then become big and then eventually go to play in the theater but with this history of coming to one place and going to the other and in a lot of places people are feeling that they're missing these spaces so if a band starts to play they have nowhere to play because they couldn't they can't go and play immediately in the city theater or play immediately in the in a bigger stage they usually go through this process of going to smaller places, playing with other bands, creating these relationships. And there is this movement that started in Europe and is reaching here as well to keep these, these spaces because they are important. And with labels sometimes it's the same. Because when you do this, you're giving the artist an, a way to grow. Because if you play more, you'll get better. It's like any other job in the world. If you do it a lot, you'll get better at it. If you play a lot, you'll be a better band. If you practice a lot, you'll be a better, better musician. But if you remove these spaces that you can go, that you can play, that you can share, you're removing this um, path to growth from, from all these artists. And this is on the live, but also on the label side. If you have a small label that can release your music or you by yourself like small EPs, small tunes and it's easy to put it outside and you can do it constantly you'll get better because you release more, you'll have more work coming outside so it's important to keep these, these channels, channels open Would you say that Porto is a city like that? Porto has some spaces actually it's not um, amazing but it has some um, People here in, in, in Portugal, usually they give the example of a city like Braga that has a lot of institutionalized venues that are really good and do a really nice program, but sometimes they like a club that a band can go and open for another band and, and there are smaller places who don't have these, these spaces as well that they are important. So uh, I think we, we forgot to mention that uh, the 90s were the, um, the year that uh, electronic music bands emerged mm -hmm. uh, in a, a spread in a bigger way and lead to, to the ages that we are on. Yeah, yeah totally. All the technology emerged and have a, a big step up in that in yeah, like you could have more instruments, more, 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 <laughs> more everything. You started to have also, it was being developed since the 70s and in the 80s was really strong and in the 90s it continued, like the DJ culture, you have a lot of people playing other people music, you could have like an all audience for that and this was also really important to develop another side of the record business because you started to release uh, um, maxis and music that was meant to be played not at home but by DJs on the dance floor and this opened a new also perspective. Also the, the computers started not only to be used on, on studio because they were used in 80s also uh, but they started to be used uh, live in, uh, in live shows and live 
electronic music and all. Mm -hmm. It was in the, in the 90s. Yeah, it was an important decade for change. And internet started to become a thing until it was really, really a thing. <laughs> and uh, during the 2000s, we really had this boom of the internet. So we, we didn't need it a physical format to listen to music anymore. You could have files, you could trade music in, in different ways. You could buy music or you could trade music in a legal way as well. So you had like Napster and that was maybe the biggest one at the time that led to what, what we have here. And it started the, the path to the streaming and not, not thought like that at the time, but it started that. That thing. And here we have like this picture because Metallica didn't like this idea a lot when it happened and they made a lawsuit against Napster and they won. And it was like a really big thing at the time. Lots of people, they got a lot of hate from everybody to, because they were kind of trying to stop the future to, to happen and, and try not to adapt to this new, new world. So in the 2000s, really in this, um, era of sharing. People were able to share stuff. People, you could have music in your laptop and somebody that you didn't know, if they had the same software as you, could search and download the music that you had in your computer. So you had this way of trading. And this was hugely important for the independent market and independent labels. Because as the major labels were stressing out and saying, oh, we're going to lose all the sales, we're going to lose, every, nobody is going to buy anything, we are doomed for life. Also radios. Also radios as well, because you are not reliable and dependent on the playlist, you could listen to music in other formats. The independent market saw this, oh, I can get to a lot of people now. Lots of people can get to my music, lots of people can see what I'm doing. And instead of seeing this sharing as a bad thing, they saw it as a good opportunity because if I like a band and if I get their MP3 for free, maybe I'll buy the record if there is a nice record, if there is a good thing that I want to, to, to contribute to the band. And that's something that really started here in the 2000s. Like people wanted to contribute, people wanted to be part of the growth of that band, people wanted to give something back to, the, to that band, to the music that the band was doing. So the independent labels were never too important about losing the music like this. They saw it more as a channel to spread the music. And then the income was done in other ways. It was done because people will buy their records and their records were not done in a really standardized way, people were concerned about let's do a really nice record, a really nice cover, let's put a poster inside, let's do this in a way that is more close with the audience. Because you need to remember that major labels were over there, like in their world of money and cocaine and not dealing with everything, with nothing. And we had all these independent artists that were really linked to their community, linked to their fan base, linked to the people that were around them. And what the internet uh, provided was a way to them to reach more people. Instead of only reaching the people in your network, you could reach more random people. They got to your music because they read someone online, because some friend gave them an MP3. And then if you had this, you could then buy the record from the band, go to see the band live, go to see their show. So the internet was a really, really deal breaker and created a whole new market for music to be distributed and music to be, to be shared among the world. And also some artists really put away the importance of having a physical release. Maybe you didn't need to have a physical release. And this, it really started on the more electronic and experimental music that sometimes you were doing records and you will sell no records at all. No one will buy your records. So you were just spending money on records, like just making physical things that will never leave your garage or, your, or a shelf. So why not only have a file? And people will get that file and will play that file and will book me to play live. It's not the file that is going to make the income for the artist. It's the people who want to see that performed live, people who want to book their, that DJ, wants to book that band, wants to book that live act. So it was really important. It was a way to democratize 
the, um, this landscape and also create a new ways of business, a new ways of making the, the, um, the record industry uh, distribute and reach another audience and sometimes not in a direct way, not in a way that the income was coming from the recorded music itself, was coming from what comes from the recorded music. So here you also started to have more structures who are like 360 in the music landscape, like we are at Lovers and Only Pops. Because back then you, you had like a label is a label, a promoter is a promoter, a booker is a booker, an agent is an agent. And with the internet era you started to have structures that I are a little bit of everything. They are labels, but they also book the artists that they release because the way that they, they can generate income is not from the music that they are selling, it's from the shows that they are selling because of the music that they release. And they are also the managers of the artists and they are also the, the promoters of the shows. And this in a smaller scale kind of helps the um, releasing market to succeed and to have loads of music that was released without any commercial thought about the music itself being sold. The music itself was more in a way of a promo to get other stuff than in a way of the income being generated by the music itself. And this was really important in this time and is still really, really used now to have this. You release a record not aiming to get money directly from the record sales, you put that on the side, you're waiting for getting live shows, you're waiting for getting your music synchronized and having publishing deals. That's what you aim for, not so, ma so much the money that you do from selling it di directly. I don't know if I want to add anything here or make any question. No, uh, just something that came to mind when you when you talked about uh, the bands being more like uh, close to the fans and like like it's just a different relationship like entirely. One band that came to mind that did this very well and I think was like kind of like revolutionary because it's sort of like the the model people are doing today with lots of content, not just music, but uh, Linkin Park in the beginning like they had they used like the internet forums and everything and they had like a community of, of fans, they were like members, and they had like a direct communication with the fans, like the, the, the band members would talk to the fans. And there were, for example, the uh, LP Underground, they used to do like releases that were specifically to like those members. So it created like an online community, and this kind of like membership thing, like it's so common now with like Patreon, OnlyFans, and like YouTube, like implemented that, but like, Linkin Park was doing that in like in the 2000, 2001, 99, I don't know. Yeah. They were already like doing this and like, it's, I think it really helped like boost their popularity. Like, yeah. they were so up close to the fans. Yeah, and that's Fun something thing. that really can keep an artist afloat for a long time if their fans think and believe that the artist is having a really close relationship with them because the hype, it goes up and it goes down. And if you don't have a solid base of people then holding you, it's really easy that the career is being are quick and, and they finish as fast as they, they start. So this kind of relationship is really, really strong. And one thing that in the, to, in the 2000s also helped here is the creation of these online platforms, like when you're saying, but the ones like Mindspace, when suddenly you really create um, it was a social network in one way, but it was also a place to discover new music. It was a way to release. If you put a song on MySpace, you're releasing a song. It's a way to putting your song up for grabs for anyone who wants to, to listen to it. And there were a lot of bands that became popular without going through any of these more traditional channels of going to a label, releasing a record, eh? just going through these communities and reaching the audience directly and having their audience engaged directly with them and suddenly they were touring and selling CDs and doing stuff without going through any of this process and just managing the stuff them, themselves. So this was really, really important into creating new ways of doing stuff and 
having this proximity with, with the audience and the people who, who are the consumer, consumers of, of the music. So he went to the 2000s with Adele. Why is here Adele? Because Adele is the biggest artist who is still connected with independent label ever. She's still releasing with XL recordings from the UK. Is a independent label. It's big, but it's independent. It's not managed by a big company. It's not nothing like that. And she's massive, as we all know. Everybody knows her. And she's still part of an independent structure. And this also was really important for a lot of artists to not have the um, trigger that usually happens when you start to get really big to go to a, to a big company as well. This was actually really important to show to lots of, we are talking like world pop level playing for thousands of people, not small things that you can keep in an independent structure and be successful. I don't think Adele believes that she could be more successful if she was at Sony or AMI or whatever. Maybe she's as successful as she can be and being part of an independent label as well. Also because the independent labels during the, the, um, this, this first decade of, of the 2000s started to become major labels in a way as well. You saw the indie becoming the new major in a lot of ways and actually occupying a space that was only occupied by major labels and major structures and suddenly the independent labels, independent artists started to occupy these this, this terrains and to occupy these markets and to have this exposure that was only relatable with, with, independent, with, the, with major labels in the, in the years before. And just to finalize this, going through the years, we end up with the year that we, are, with the decade that we are now, and with a platform that really revolutionated this independent artist and independent uh, label system that is Bandcamp and is direct to consumer sales and and um, and relationship with your with your with your fan base. Because when we were talking about MySpace and we were talking with all these other platforms, it was a community, but you could play the music, but it was not designed to sell in the way that Bandcamp sells today. In, you had to have friends, you had like all this engaging platform that is really different from what Bandcamp it is, Bandcamp is a platform to play and to sell music. But the way that the the, um, the platform is designed, it has a lot to do with the way that all these independent labels work. You understand how it works, we, not, we understand the cuts it, it makes. It, it's not like um, a platform, I could say like in all our releases, our artists do way more money in Bandcamp than they do in Spotify. Way more. Well, Spotify for us is, is, a, is more of a presence. You know, like if somebody wants to listen, this is Spotify. But the real income comes from a platform like this. Spotify doesn't have income. No, it, it's maybe a, a major way of. Uh, uh, Spotify uh, had lots of uh, has no income so in, in the last maybe ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like it was. It was uh, a way uh, of put people hearing music and work with majors mm -hmm. because they, they own the rights and all that stuff. So it's a way of promoting music at their way. Yeah. Basically. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. platforms like Bandcamp came and created this really well-designed, really well-built platform where artists or labels can relate directly with their audience, sell their records in a way that is fair and everybody understands what's going on. And you see a lot of fans preferring to use this platform in a conscious way than listening to uh, music in other platforms where they know that the artists are not being 
well paid. And here they know that the artists, when they buy the music, the, the money is going directly through them. So you have a lot of artists and labels that Bandcamp, and I, I can tell by our example, became the most important distributor of our music. Our biggest income comes straightly from here, and it was not like this. We are, of course, we love to put records on the, on the stores, and we want to keep this, this relationship. Of course, we like to have the songs on the radio, we still have the songs on the other platforms of streaming. But even when we look at the Excel of the numbers, Bandcamp is by miles the one where we sell more physical goods and the one where we sell more digital music. But there's the other one is like 70% less than, than, than here. And for most of the artists that work in our parameter is, is, is the same. Sorry, Maris, uh, on the first round table we had about uh, music and technology, uh, there was, of course, this, this uh, question of Bandcamp uh, versus uh, uh, Spotify came up a lot because it's a, it's a pretty heated up conversation also. And, uh, and yeah, Bandcamp is, a, is much more transparent, much more fair uh, source of income. But also there was, um, there was a perspective there uh, comparing Spotify more to a radio than to actually uh, mm -hmm. a retailer because, yeah, if you get one million of plays that uh, this is, I think it was Andrew Dover who was uh, talking about this, if you get one million plays on BBC Radio, you also don't get much money for it. You get exposure and that's exactly what you get on Spotify. So it's also, I think it's also important maybe to, th to rethink this comparison that we are making between mm -hmm. these uh, things because we use it actually for different purposes. No? Yeah. One we use to actually sell music to the people and the other we, we use to promote that music like the same way that we did with Napster, that we do if we upload our files for people to pirate them, you know, like... Yeah, uh, totally. <coughs> and even with physical goods, like, we have records on FNAC, for example, more for exposure than to sell them, because if I sell a record directly to a consumer, I'll get... The, the consumer pays 20 euros and I'll, 20 euros and I'll get 18. In FNAC, the consumer pays 25 and I get like 5 euros. Yes. So it's not even good that I sell so many records as, at FNAC. So it's kind of the same thing that you were saying. It's just sometimes not putting these platforms on the same level, but seeing how they can contribute in different ways. Uh, I know that uh, if there are several uh, digital distrib distributors uh, mm -hmm. around. Uh, by that way, I think we can put the digital uh, releases in on several plat platforms. Uh, as independent, we can uh, put use Spotify and uh, and uh, Bandcamp. Yes, they are, Yeah, because they work in different in different ways. Uh, Spotify, you can't deal directly with them. You need to go through a distributor. Yeah, there could be. But there are some independent. Direct, no. Direct, no, no, no. There is only if you're. Both. Only if you're like Beyonce or <laughs> something like that. But, okay. but even middle, big size, small, no. It's like always through a distributor, and you have some that are really good for for independent artists or labels like CD Baby, Awal, Altafont. They yeah. they are easy to create an account, easy to deal. And what they do is like you put your song there and you choose, I want to be in Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, and they spread it to all of them and they gather all the, and then they send you a report with everything. For Bandcamp, you don't deal with this, it's directly, you put your songs, they charge a fixed fee on a percentage, sorry, fee on each download of digital goods that you do, and they charge also a fee on the sales that you do through their through their platform. So you don't you don't need to use the same the same same channels to to one or or the other. And also on Bandcamp, you can offer your music. I have mine for free, so yep. anyone that wants can download it for free. So just not a matter of selling it. Yep. Yeah, exactly. You can have your price and yeah, and yeah, Bandcamp uh, doesn't promote AI. Uh, but 
Spotify is investing in AI uh, war machines with the investment that the musicians don't earn, so it's not the best platform. Although I use it to distribute my music, because you don't have other possibilities that if you want to be known, uh, you have to be on the platform that is most used. In yep. this case, it's Spotify. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. and each audience has a way to consume music. Uh, th this, these were numbers from I think it was two years ago, from twenty. No, that was before the pandemic. It was twenty nineteen. The platform that most people were listening to music was still YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Even like miles away from Spotify and from any of the platforms, YouTube was the way that. Most of the people were listening online to, to their music because we are talking not music fans, we are talking about everybody. Yeah. People go, YouTube, write something and they listen to music through, through that. So, so when you want to have reach, you really need to be in all these channels yeah. from, from one to the other. Because if you so choose just one, imagine that in my label I'm really, I don't cope with this um, owners of these platforms and I just want to have my music on Bandcamp. I can, I can do that, but I need to be conscious that I'm going to restrict my audience to a certain amount of people who deals with this music, who knows the platform, because if I go home and I talk to my mom, she knows about YouTube, but she doesn't know about Bandcamp. She knows how to go to YouTube and put a song that she likes playing. She doesn't know how to do that in Bandcamp. And probably Bandcamp won't have the song that she wants to, to listen. So. Maybe because it's not so interconnected with Google and other no. companies. Okay. Uh, I have a um, question. Do you pay fees when you offer uh, your music in Bandcamp? No, no. So how it's, it's like they get their share? Because they get a part of what you sell. But they it doesn't sell. They it's offering. They probably don't get so doesn't anything. get the share? No. <laughs> They get from other people, or if someone goes there and says, I want to... Because in, in this um, download for, f for free, you can, if you want, you can give a price. Oh, okay. you, they are like for free, but if you want, you can say, I want to give 50 euros for this song because I like this artist and I want to contribute. Then they will have a cut from, from that sale. But if it's free, they have... They have to pay energy. They yeah. To yeah, but th they have this business model, and also they are also a tech company. So for ages they didn't need, they didn't need any money. They were just like investment thing, and now they are they are doing. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. What what happens in Bandcamp when you stream, as a, as a listener, you don't. There's no payment, and after like four plays, it shows up a message say, oh, you, you want to. Yeah, I don't support us. They try to do it with that, but with streams they get nothing. One thing that most people don't know is that they have an ad, and if you... Uh, one thing that most people don't know is Bandcamp has an app, and when you buy music, they stay on your uh, collection, mm -hmm. and you can hear, hear to the music offline, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. To me, I, yeah. I only use this, I don't use Spotify. <laughs> I use Bandcamp and SoundCloud. Yeah, and SoundCloud actually is trying to create a streaming platform as well that is more fair to the artists and they have the backup of really big artists like uh, Portishead and some most British artists were trying to migrate their catalogs to SoundCloud because it was a direct from artist to provider and the, the fees were much smaller to the platform. So there's a lot of people who are not happy with the things. Like Neil Young as well was with, I don't remember the platform that he created. Uh, the I think Neil Young took all their... Uh, Tide, I think it was it Tide. Yeah. Just this, this may be slightly off, but um, when we talked about uh, uh, that most people uh, listen to YouTube, uh, listen to music on YouTube, like for me personally, 
this is just as a listener. I find um, I find it more fun to discover music on YouTube. Like, if I don't think about, if I just think about what's um, uh, a nice experience for me, I think YouTube still has a uh, pleasing uh, interface where you still have the visuals and it's um, it's easy to surf the web. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I want to use Bandcamp more consciously and I'm going more in that direction, but it's not as um, uh, intuitive as YouTube at this mm -hmm. point. Well, they, uh, but it's very different kind of uh, way to, to navigate, but you have like this amazing editorial uh, content that takes you to places that you never imagined even existed, which is mm -hmm. also cool, no? I think, I think YouTube is easier to stay inside your comfort zone as a listener, and on Bandcamp you can completely like move out of your comfort zone and just listen to like really stuff that, yeah, that you wouldn't find any other way, you know? And there's, and they have like di different uh, tools for that. They have the new and notable, they have these articles about very specific geographic uh, movements or scenes, no? And for me, it's really, and you, they have uh, Bandcamp Radio. They have like uh, each month, they have like the best of electronic, best of experimental, best of jazz, best of blah, blah, where you can al always check also their curatorship about this kind of stuff. So it's kind of, it, I think it's just a bit maybe more difficult to get uh, used to, but it's also pretty, they have really interesting tools. I think like the thing about playlisting with the uh, Bandcamp is that it's not shareable, I, I think, no? Like, you can listen, I when you make a playlist on Bandcamp, they, it's a, um, a functionality that they've, uh, they've set up recently. Yeah, it was just now, like a yeah. month ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and it's cool because you can listen to all the stuff that you bought, but I think you can share it because the other people didn't buy the same tracks. And I think also music, one of the things that is really important uh, in music is sharing, you know? Like, yeah. if you have these songs you like and you want to... Like this, we, we, did a, we did a playlist for break, with the, the favorite songs of uh, most of the speakers and some of the people involved. And actually, we have to share it with you. <laughs> but, but it was much easier to do it on, uh, on Spotify, you know, because, well, first everything is there, not everything, uh, but a lot of things are there, and then it's shareable. So this is also a big, uh, yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, does uh, Bandcamp has a high stream rate? for high quality. Values. Yes, you can download FLAC, WAVE, oh, yeah. yeah. Also, all, all the, the quality. About uh, what you were talking, uh, Spotify is well uh, implemented that also has, uh, if you have contacts, uh, it can see which contacts ha uh, has uh, the Spotify and you can check which people knew each people like. what they are hearing yeah. so they you can i can see what you are hearing what uh, and i can easily go but hear band what band you are also band band. I, I yes notifications mm -hmm. from a lot of people from what they are no no buying. you have a chat a, a mini chat at your life yeah, yeah, that yeah. you see all all your contacts and yeah. what they are hearing online in real time yeah. and that is fun also to know more yeah, music yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that stuff I just wanted to say that it's very hard for me to find music on Bandcamp, though I love the idea and I probably will upload my music there, but it's super hard to, to find, like if you aren't really connected to the mm, actual artist mm -hmm. you want to listen to, yeah. it's super hard because it's like a, a wide universe of, of, of music and yeah, I think is they have this content choice where they create all these articles instead of having this search engine. Yeah. But I, I totally agree with you. Way, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think they they because they don't see themselves as a streaming platform. Mm -hmm. yeah. They see it as all this platform for all this music and this content, and I, I really like like as a consumer to navigate towards their articles. I discovered music that will be really hard for me to discover if it wasn't there inviting these journalists from Indonesia to do a thing about the noise thing from 
uh, their country. And that thing is more like cur curated basis, but instead of being playlist based or shuffle based, I think they, they have this idea of we got a team and a theme and we're going to do something with this because we have all this all this music and all this all this content. It's quality content, so uh, well and they well yeah, and they don't want to compete with. I think they don't want to be in the position that they don't want to compete with the playlist from Spotify or with the way that because in Spotify they have this algorithm or in YouTube where you listen to this kind of music and AI will tell you oh, maybe you like this music because you like this. They don't have this thought. There is more like. I have this theme and I invite it because it's not the algorithm who's telling you, it's someone who's signing and who shows those tracks for you to listen. And this is, I think, is really different. It's not AI who's telling, oh, listen to this or listen to that. It's more like, yeah. no, Martha or Patrick, they were there and they want you to have this. And as also, I think, is on the wire, there is a really nice article about this, about like how the, the future of they're talking about music and, and books because we have AI and AI knows you so well, but you will only be surprised when you have content that is made by people yeah. because people will be the ones who can really humanize the content and show you stuff. Because if you, if you are only listening to music on the suggestions of Spotify and YouTube, certainly you are just listening to the same music yeah. over and over again. Yeah. You're like in this bubble. <laughs> Spotify knows that you love American jazz from the 2000s, and you listen all the American jazz from the 2000s, but it will be really hard to get out of it. And I think Ben Camp has this different approach to these are the person, this is a person who shows this for you to listen. And before you release, you can send them the editorial notes to them so they can know when you release if they like, they can do like an article on you. Like, yeah, yeah, and I think I think they will continue on that, on that, on that path of humanizing the content instead of. But, but I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah no, totally. No. Also, I wanted to add that uh, we think in the future. Um, well, this is something that some of my students told me recently. Like Peter, can you please? make me a compilation because like any time I want to search for music I'm practicing I'm, I'm teaching a degree in jazz and modern music so they want to look for I don't know Sarabon or I don't know people from the 50s or vivo music whatever and they can't find this this music it's, just, it's impossible no so they they are asking me directly to make compilations for them so they can really have the music they want to study or or, or, yeah. or listen to and and this is i don't know this is made by the algorithm again I, I yeah guess. yeah or the, you could have the one made by the algorithm or maybe you can pay for someone to make you and they'll make you like a proper one and sell it to other to other people it's because there could be also a business opportunity now because we never had so much content as we yeah, have. That's true. It's, it's insane. Super wide. Yeah, like, like because we were talking when we started this this uh, travel through the decades. In the fifties, we had these record stores with the studios who were saying who's recording and who's not, mm -hmm. and who's releasing. Nowadays, all of us can go home and today we can put something online. Yeah, but th this also takes us to a, a lack of criteria. There's yeah. no criteria anymore. But then the criteria will be then the criteria were the record labels. Now the criteria maybe wouldn't be the everyone the has a criteria. Yeah. But what happens when there were important people of music history and they don't exist anymore because they are not in your well, app? They is, they exist because one thing that why is someone important because someone told us that they were important. No, it's always yeah, the the they, they create something yeah, that was new and of course. They made some development of new. But it's always but it's always like it was always a human part of the filter and someone wrote about it, someone talked about it, somebody yeah. went to the show, somebody, and the 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 aspects of importance and quality is really doable. I can put a song playing now and I can tell you this is the best song ever written in the world. And you can say this is the worst piece of bullshit that I ever listened in my life. And I'm not wrong and you are not wrong as well. Because 
and then I can have 100 people backing me up, and this will be great. And if you have zero people backing you up, you, you are wrong. And this is kind of demo democratizing the, the things. But I think what will happen is we will have a human aspect coming to us during these next years, creating this playlist, like we're saying, writing content about things that we really want to, 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 to explore more. Because even the, the I, 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 I'm lucky to, every year as a teacher, uh, relating with new, new people that want to work in, in this business. And I'm, I learn a lot with this. Uh, every year it's a different class that comes from a different generation and perceives things in a different way. And the way that the content is absorbed now is totally different than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. Like uh, in a generation that is now 30 to 40, we will listen to CDs from our albums from one end to the other many times until someone gave us another CD and you'll know that music from back end. Now I can download a hundred songs and I can listen 20 seconds of each one and maybe I don't like anyone and then I don't care and it's, it, it changes it. And we, we can behave in two ways or we are mad about it or we, it is what it is and we need to to, to try to engage and maybe humanizing it is the, is the, is the, and you see it sometimes like there is a really in these big artists now like you know, like Rosalia or a lot of things that makes them and there's being some 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 people writing about it that makes them being so popular in the albums is that is because the, the conceptual album is back in a way it's not just a bunch of songs yeah. it's like a, a story. They don't just record and put some song. No, they create a history, there is a narrative. So people feel like I need to listen to this record, not I'm going to listen to these individual songs and I don't care. So maybe it needs to change again and it, it, it will be always changing. Yeah. Also, we talked about this during the last days that all these excesses and all these fashions and technological and you know fashions and excesses also have a comeback, also have like a response. And a lot of times the, the, they will eventually f uh, become balanced, you know, because all the is what happens you now. There is this innovation. Everybody goes uh, try to be on the wave, you no, know, and then at some point you start to think, okay, but uh, <laughs> so you, you start to have. Uh, uh, we're talking this about. Well, about the technology and AI and NFTs and well, what's not, but also, like if you think of electronic music, uh, suddenly everything is electronic, and everybody's surfing that wave. And at some point, so someone says, "No, yeah, but uh, this song has a real piano player." And everybody's like, "Yeah," you know, because you have to come back from that. Also, you know, like it's na it's, it's natural to go with the flow and to follow the new trends, but also then reality comes, you know, comes back at you and. Uh, and we as a species, I think, uh, and society are known for this, for following trends. But then things that I think usually balance out. And I think, you know, this, uh, yeah, what we've been discussing also in all this, like uh, AI is going to go much, 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 much more, for example. No, and it will be, is already in everything, but will be much more. But also the, the, the human side of all this thing will also come up and come out as a response to all this uh, uh, automatization. Yeah, and it's really, hopefully. yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> or we'll be not here <laughs> in 10 years. Yeah, and sometimes, it's, sometimes it happens a lot, like, like um, an error or a barrier in a technology field after some years is seen as a quality, like with vinyl. There was like, oh, this is so boring to turn the things and not, not so many space and the noise. So uh, CD comes and everybody's happy. But after 20 years, oh, I miss that sound and I miss turning, I miss this. Or with photography, all these pictures come all yellow and after, with this machine, with this Leica. And after 20 years, oh, I want these effects because... So we start to see the, the errors then as qualities and as personality. And I really believe that that will be the way because we, we need to humanize things because otherwise we'll have a lot of different people being all the same because the, the algorithm will start to contribute equally to everybody if we don't have these 
thought that is more in the outside, if you don't throw uh, uh, wrong things into there, if you don't mix it up, it will be, we will all thinking, thinking the same way because the algorithm in the, in the end and the AI is fed by us. If you start to feed them all the same stuff because we are always being fed by them, it's, it's going to be... <laughs> yeah, it's a sad. Yeah, it's Sorry, just wanted to share something about something we were talking before, but there's actually an app that was independently developed, it's not connected to Bandcamp in any way, called By Music Club. It's bymusic.club, where you can actually create uh, uh, playlists based on Bandcamp music, and you can share them, and you can embed them, and uh, yeah, so if anyone is interested in that. Buy as in compre, tchau, or bo? Buy of Which buy? Buy, uh, uh, buy of uh, buy music to, to <laughs> yeah, yeah, to buy music. <laughs> no, because the idea is that you have the playlist and it's for free, okay. but then that you feel like it, you go and buy it, you know, because yeah. nothing is, if you're li just listening, nothing is going to the artist. So, yeah. They, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and. Um, And just, and just to keep it together, nice. And just to, to warp up this first part in the morning, I don't know if someone has more questions or more comments. You think? I have one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Always in English. <laughs> I have one, but I'm not sure if it's your next slide, so I could wait. My next slide is lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's if it is a matter for the next piece of workshop, but is there a prediction amongst music industry or a personal opinion of yours about which is the next break in music? Will we have another? I'm, is, it, is it going to be online, like another form or stream? I noticed by your comment that AI, not as much because the lack of humanity, but what are the odds for which are the predictions? What is going to happen? <laughs> There's a lot of th people who think in different ways and maybe the truth will be someone in the middle of everything that's been said. B because we, we're seeing in one way the bigger, th if we, look, we were talking then about the 70s and the 80s, but we're living again in the 80s. Everything is really big. The big things, like the big shows, the big art, are, were never as big as they are now. The festivals are insanely big. You have festivals for 100,000 people, 200,000 people. Things that are really dehumanized. And some people think that this is the way and things will be even bigger and uh, AI and, and technology will, 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 will continue to get things in a mass um, culture, even more woe effects and you see like, I don't know if you if you, um, you you were aware probably because you live in this country that Coldplay were playing here yeah. a few a few weeks ago, and the show is insane, like visually in terms of spectacle, it is is not a band playing on a stage. It's a lot more than that, and this is because they need to put on a show to entertain fifty thousand people every night and then be woe and come back every day. But there is another part of the industry that really feels that small curated, independent, more personal things are the future and then these big events will collapse and will be the end of it and the future will be smaller structures with less people, with other kind of organization that will drive. And maybe it's not one or, or the other, maybe it will be always people for going to massive things because there's something like when I remember last year that all the major festivals, if you remember, they, all of them went wrong. Loads of queuing, people suffering, no water, and everybody was... Yeah, <laughs> everything was like... And this is the end of big festivals, but this year all of them are sold out again. Yeah. Because audience changes, people want to have this ex experience in their lives, people forget and only remember the good part. But in the other, the other hand, you also have the small things and they will continue to thrive as well and they continue to have an audience as well. <laughs> I think it's more the capability of noticing what can we 
we do and what fits what we, we want to do. I, I, I wanted to give, it kind of fits in what we were saying because I wanted to give this example before, before we finished. That is linked with releases and what's wrong and what's not wrong. And as sometimes this wrong and right is only relatable with the place that we are doing and the music that we are, we are playing. I, I was lucky to live in Brazil for a year and I lived in this city, in Recife, and where they have this really big brega and funk artists. And at one time I went to this show from a, a brega artist and it was a show for 20,000 people and the artist played the same, the same song 10 times. First time, regular time, second time, reggae version, third time, techno reggae version, same song. Just one song. Everybody was happy, having the time of their lives. And I was really shocked in the end. I thought, what, what happened here? <laughs> <laughs> this person was playing the same song ten times and everybody was having a blast. And I thought, this is wrong. But then I thought, no, I'm wrong. This is right, this is a way of releasing music for this community and everybody is happy and most of this music was never discovered or distributed towards the ways that we are speaking here, is doing pen drives that people record at home, the people who sell them is people on bikes who have radios with speakers and they sell it directly like a pen with one giga of songs and, and this is music releasing as well. I can't say that a record that is released by the Beatles is more of a record than someone from uh, Pernambuco who's releasing a pen drive with 10 songs. What is, they have an audience, he sells, he sells 20,000 tickets for people to see him. Yeah. Is wrong? No, he's right. Maybe if he comes to Europe, and this happens a lot in the what we call the world music market. Yeah. But I was listening to the to an interview from, from I think it was this Cape Verdean band called uh, Bully Mundo, that they were saying, hey, when we, we come to Portugal, we are really sad because we can only play one hour and a half, and we are used to play eight hours, nine hours. And because it's the way that those bands play, sometimes with different songs, but they play forever, because it's the way that they play, usually in the vials, in the context of it. And then, when you come to Europe or America, you need to, change your art in a way that we perceive that. And I th sometimes we are too closed in the way that we do stuff and we think that that's the only, uh, not, uh, that's the only right way to do stuff. It's the only right way for us. Yeah. That we, we are used to have an album with eight songs or nine, all of them are different, there's a slow one, a fast one, sometimes it's just one song. And this is for us, it's the way that we conceptualize what is a record, what is a, a release. But it doesn't mean that is the, the right one. And maybe if I want to go and be a star in the biofunk community in Pernambuco, maybe I need to do a record with one song played 10 different times in a pen drive. And, and it, may, it might work or, or not. But it's, and I think now people are more and more aware of that. So there's, there are less and less people doing stuff that they don't need to do. Like, there's this dream that so maybe sometimes a lot of artists wanted to record an album and do a vinyl. I think now there are more people who are aware that they don't need to do a vinyl. Why I'm going to spend 3,000 euros in a record that nobody will sell? I can focus on having great singles because my audience wants that and the music that I do is looking for that. And that's the most important thing, like knowing when we are a label or an artist, what are we doing and what resonates in the audience that we want to conquer and what's the best tools to come to that audience? And because it's not the standardized thing. If you do it standardized, it will go wrong because it can serve the purposes of these artists, even inside a label. Like we work with 20 artists. We can't work with all of them in the same way. We don't have the same plans for all of them. We don't do the same kind of releases for all of them. There are artists that we sell, we do vinyl because we know that they will sell them. But there are other artists that we just release online because we know that it works like that and we, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to have a physical format to, to go with it. Any questions because we, before we finish this morning talk? <laughs> all good? 
So, now, before, in the morning we were looking at all this way from the 50s till now, and now in the afternoon we will see and talk about some tools, about, talk about some, some things that we can use in getting our releases ready to, to come out to work. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.